so guys it's another mind-blowing message coming from kenneth okonkwo it's been long you've not heard from him but i tell you this time he came loaded you need to just take your time and listen to what kenneth okonkwo got to say i mean he has sent strong messages to the government of the day anarchy looms where in nigeria how do you mean anarchy is defined as a state of disorder due to absence of or non-recognition of authority or other controlling systems in this nation now you could see the absence of government in the security and welfare of the people total absence guys kenneth okonko has described this government as a government that has given birth to monsters and his question remains if your wife goes through the pain of labor and at the end of the day she gives birth to a monster will you be happy with that birth so guys a whole lot was revealed in this video you need to take your time grab a cup of coffee relax and listen to what kenneth okonko got to say because because this government keeps making so many mistakes that are not redeemable honestly we are heading to anarchy like you've just heard him say so guys let me just allow you listen to what kenneth okonko said i mean it was entertaining it was so educative and i tell you you've got so much knowledge to gain from this video just take your time and watch on the tube when you are in hollywood do you miss it you know i will always be an actor forever and it's a job that does not have a retirement age i carried myself into the I did not bring movie world into me. That is why, amongst all the things I ever read, theater as wasn't one of them. So I am just a born actor. So you those. never studied theater at? Not even for one day. And remember, because we were the pioneers, yeah, nobody asked you whether you, as a matter of even the producers, most of them then never studied theater at. So they just look at you and see whether you can interpret your role. And that's it. And so I carried myself into the movie world. Because from the time go, as I was growing up, people look at me as an object to watch. The way I walk, the way I talk. So they actually made me to know that I am a natural actor. And that was how the interest blossomed. So I now went into... The acting world myself knowing that i have gotten the seal of approval from people by my natural self and so i just moved in there mm. carried my natural self just... ming if you were to choose between laura and uh, acting well, which one would you choose both <laughs> but you i mean you know what they say about uh uh code of uh, professional ethics in in, in law I mean, you almost cannot do any other thing aside practice of law. So how do you juggle both? The other one is the promotion of culture and arts. It's allowed when you're doing something to promote the culture of the people. When we started it, it was not to be a profession. It was to be a hobby. Just like you play football in the evenings as a hobby. And it became so successful that people now wanted more. And that was how we started making more. Every profession I've always subscribed to has always been very conservative. I was trained first as an executive gentleman in business administration. I was trained as a reverend gentleman in theology. I was trained as a diplomatic gentleman in diplomacy that was where i did my international and diplomacy and i was trained as a learned gentleman you see all these things are very conservative and when you have all these things on your head you must have to develop ways to unwind so entertainment has always been my best way to unwind oh now i chose the movie world you know um, whoever subscribed to be an actor cannot say he's a saint. He cannot lay hand on being a good guy. So I wasn't a good guy when I was growing up. You know what I mean. 
I am an entertainer. You're a bad guy. Well, <laughs> I am an entertainer. You know what I mean? So, but which role so would you say? It you to yeah. wind very well. You know, you read, read, read. Your head is full. Then you go out and cavort and play. You know what I mean? Yeah. And your head is empty again and you're back to conservativeness. So. Yeah. What role would you say that will never leave your memory as an actor? If I say this, you will be surprised. But the truth is that all the roles will not leave my memory. And the reason is this. I make a choice of the movies I play. Really? Yes. I read all my scripts. So if it doesn't move me while reading the script, I'm not going to make a choice of it. All the movies I made, I remember all of them. So they made impact on me first. Name them. Is it living in bondage? Is it betrayal? Is it taboo? Is it culprit? Is it Watertight? Is it Ganiwe? Is it ROC? Whichever one. Because I will be convinced first in the world you're creating and in the lesson you want to communicate before I accept the role. Mm. So all of them. But you would not negate the fact that by the law of preeminence, living in bondage has preeminence. And they say the first cult is always the deepest. So by virtue of that first cult, it was very deep. Mm. You know, it announced you. So you are still living in the bondage of living in bondage rule? No. <laughs> <laughs> I am delivered. <laughs> and you know, we did a sequel to the Living in Bondage in 2020, in 2020 yeah. And uh, you saw in that 2020, you know what they said? Breaking free. Mm. So even with the concept of living in bondage, I am no longer living in bondage. <laughs> 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 I am delivered. You know? But be, being a ritualist mm -hmm. in a movie and being a priest, I've seen you act and being uh, a lover boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Which is more challenging to you? All of them. Because the whole idea of movie is like you are replicating the world. When I play lead, 98% of the time, and the world is full of ups and downs, whether you're a priest, whether you are a prince, whether you are a saint, the world is up and down. So every of those roles was challenging to me. Because of the cyclical nature of human existence. So, all of them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you were to kiss on, on the movie set, would yeah. you take it? Yes. I took it before. Are you doing it again? Anytime. Mm -hmm. If a doctor is supposed to operate on a woman, even if he's a born again doctor, will he go in to do the job or not? She be wearing cloth as a theologian. I imagine that maybe kissing might not be a very comfortable thing for you to act in. I am bringing the issue of the doctor to tell you about theology when you are doing something in prosecution of your job, it becomes your job, becomes your work. You want to replicate the reality of life. If you can't do it well, look for another profession. If you are a doctor and you say you are a theologian and you don't want to see naked women because you say that in the Bible they say don't see her nakedness, look for another job. Mm. I mean, when you were in Hollywood, it wasn't as profitable as it is right now. No. Was it? it? We were the originators of the profiteering nature of Hollywood. I made fortune as a Hollywood actor. It was just 2020 that I decided to start winding up. Are you a retired actor? Hollywood actor? If you have been in a profession for 30 years and you're consumed by the love of your nation, you would come to a point where you would think that you've done enough. You don't retire from acting, but maybe from 
the public exhibition of acting have made a determination that that should decrease so that my fight for a new Nigeria will increase. But if you, if you see a role today I've that you're convinced... Seen, I've seen rules and I've turned them down. There is no time anymore for it. Hmm. So Nollywood, a part of you in Nollywood is dead. Or is, is in hibernation. You, I've already told you there's no retirement age. A part of me in Nollywood will always be alive. Forever. I could go in to build a movie school. I could go in to be a producer. As an executive producer. So there's no retirement age. So that you are not showing yourself on the screen doesn't mean you're no longer in Hollywood. What will make you take your role now? Maybe if Nigeria becomes better than America. Really? Yes. Are you going see that happening anytime soon? In my generation, the possibility is there. Because we have all it takes. We have men. We have materials. We have money. The only thing that is lacking is the synergistic effect. The power to combine, to utilize, to allocate these resources optimally to produce the desired goods and services that will make us achieve our objectives. That leadership that has the ability to inspire people towards unusual creative ability, not to manipulate or intimidate them. That is what is lacking. And that is what we are coming in to produce. And we will do it by the grace of God. As part of your training in theology, you, I mean, you are a theologian. Is it something that you could take at some point in your life, a full-time priest, being a full-time priest? Would you be willing to take that? I don't think that I introduced myself or you did that, that uh, 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 a prophet. So I don't know what will happen tomorrow. But I'm already a teacher of the gospel. Because everybody who is a theologian is called to teach the gospel. And so are you a born again that. Christian? By the grace of God I am. And does not make me to invoke any spirit of perfection on myself. I'm a born again Christian. And I thank God I am. If you were a bad boy and you want to be a good guy, you can't do it by your might or by your power. There has to be a supervening spiritual force that will regenerate your body because this flesh cannot be born again. It can only be subordinated to the supervening power of the spirit. You need such intervention to become a different man. That was what God helped me to do. It can only be done by the grace of God. And I think I'm better off for it. So if God calls you to become a priest today, or maybe God has been calling you and not, you've, not been, <laughs> you've not been listening enough. <laughs> so we could see a reverend, the reverend, <laughs> Kenneth Okwonkwa. Is it possible? Okay. I'm laughing because, so if God is calling me, it's shame that he's hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> I might see the calling on your life, but you may not even be hearing it yet. You see, I do not believe that showcasing God must be done in a formal way. You should showcase God by the way you live your life every day. Jesus Christ did not tell you that the way you will identify his followers by, should be by what they say. Indeed, he said, some will call me Lord, Lord, and will even do miracles. But on the judgment day, I will say, get behind me. I don't know you. You walk out of iniquity. Then when I was reading that, I was like, how then do you know? He said, by their fruits, we shall know them. Don't you think that if all these people that are parading themselves as Christians in Nigeria are truly Christians, don't you think we will not be having the problem we're having today? What are their fruits? So I'm not carried away by the formal advertisement of anybody. 
as a man of God or this portfolio or this? What are your fruits? Are you a man of God? I am a child of God. Not a man of God. I would not want to go by that name. I am Kenneth Okungu, the servant. So I would want to be a child of God. Mm. I mean, so, Anna, you know what Jesus said? Yeah. He said, the kingdom of God are for the people like these children. So when people arrogate themselves on these names, I just know that they've not met Christ. I am a child of God. The gospel now, these days, for some priests, is very juicy and it looks very profitable. That is why you have so many men of God. When we were in the university, when it was the deeper life brand of born again, you didn't see most of these people there. And when you started seeing the dreadlock style of born again, the yeah, 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 yeah. Money, 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 money. Good. Then everybody put on suit and became born again. And the devil went to the shop and bought King James Version of the Holy Bible and headed to the church. You know the style of the devil? If I cannot get them by persecution, I will get them by compromise. So you think the devil has compromised the church? One of the headquarters where the devil lives very well now is in most churches. And you can quote me on that. Based on what you see? Based on what I see, based on what I know, based on the natural progression of the manipulations of the devil. The devil will start by intimidation, by punishment by persecution just like he started in the bible the devil discovered that when he started persecuting the church they started scattering and as they are scattering they are carrying the gospel wherever they went to and the gospel was growing so he now said no let me use the leader of the world and when he becomes born again if he declares the state a state religion the bishop doesn't need to fast again and cast me and bind me to get money. He said, we just give him money. So all the things that they have been praying to get, they don't pray anymore because he's given to them. But they don't know that that is what is going to compromise their faith. So these posterity preaching pastors, you are against such? I am not against it. I am against pros the prosperity without salvation. Prosperity must be based on salvation. It must be based on the blessings of God makes one rich and adds no sorrow to it. If there is anything you're giving in for that prosperity, it's no longer from God. Because God said, if God can give his only begotten son freely for us, what else can he not freely give to us? Hmm. So it has to be prosperity. I'm not an agent of poverty. I've never preached it. I don't look it. But I'm an agent of hard work mixed with grace. It will make you to make that money and you'll spend it in a manner that will glorify God and glorify the existence of man. And I mean, there are those who, who think and perceive you as a very intolerant religious wise, uh, uh, religious wise uh, especially when you move against the Muslim Muslim ticket and that those who have described you as politically naive that you understand less of the Nigerian politics that's why you think so that for things to work and it happens that you may be wrong at the end of the day thinking that a Muslim Muslim ticket wasn't the way to go first and foremost I accepted Muslim Christian ticket I campaigned for a Muslim, a northern Muslim, when it was even unpopular to do it in my place. And I have done it twice. With President Buhari? Musa Yaradua. President Buhari. These are Muslims from the north, 
from the Sharia compliant state. I have no regrets. Most of my political friends are Muslims. So when you go Muslim, Muslim ticket, I rejected it because it's unconstitutional. What part of the constitution is this? We are talking about section 14. We are talking about the constitution says the composition of any government and the conduct of its affairs must be done in such a manner as to recognize the federal character. You must recognize the diversity of your country. It's section 14, 3 and 4. And he said, the reason is this. By the constitution. So that your government can command national loyalty and give everybody a sense of belonging. You know the truth. The people that are suffering most in this government today are Muslims. So what has the Muslim Muslim ticket benefited them? It was a political strategy. It was not a religious strategy, but it worked. It failed. Because they won the election through technical glitch. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that technical glitch glitched the original election. And by 4.30 a.m. when people were asleep, they gave us results that emanated from technical glitch. They failed. But those who believe that uh, your position as to who won the election was wrong legally religion. and procedurally. Einek declared the person who won the election. Mm -hmm. The court at two different occasions declared that Bola Tinubu and the APC won the election. But you don't believe it. Right. I was in the court of appeal. The first order is we asked the court of appeal to give to us was an order that I next should allow us to inspect the beavers. Three orders. I neck obeyed none of it. And yet I neck went to the same court and told the court to give them order to reconfigure the beavers before we inspected it. And the court did nothing. And then when we proceeded in the hearing of the case, the court now said we had 21 days to produce every evidence which INEC refused to give us. And then they say subpoena witnesses cannot come to give witness. To come. They cannot come to give evidence after 21 days. 176,000 pulling units. They say we should prove it pulling unit by pulling unit. And you have three weeks. Is that not the position of the law? I disagreed with them because from the law I read, it couldn't have been the position. Because you are dealing with an adversary who you say did something wrong. The adversary has interest in hiding information from you. And then you, the court, you're saying, if he can hide this information and this evidence from you for 21 days, your case is dead. It couldn't have been the intent of the law. But the court says that, I mean, for you, you are claiming yes. and alleging yes. that there is no substantial mm -hmm. uh, compliance mm -hmm. with the electoral law. Oh, yes. And uh, you, the law says you must prove beyond reasonable doubt. The, the law is very clear on electronic transmission. Now, let me tell you the rule of law. In one case, miscellaneous offenses to Abu Nawaz, that they find rule of law as doing everything according to the law and making sure the government actions are done according to the law. And that case excluded discretionary powers and arbitrary powers of government. And you know what the courts ruled? They said INEC had the discretion to choose whether they would transmit electronically or not. 
that is tangentially against even the fundamental definition of rule of law. No creature of law is allowed to use arbitrary power or discretionary power to do anything. That's against rule of law. Because the definition of rule of law is that everything must be done according to law. And the law is very clear. You must transmit electronically. Section 65 is there. Then, if you don't want to say section 65 because they don't use certain words, what about section 64? Mr. Okonko, what is the standard of proof in an election matter? Election matters are so generic. The standard of proof is balance of probability because it's a civil proceeding. Mm -hmm. However, if you are alleging any offense within the criminal proceeding by the evidence act, the standard of proof of that particular allegation which is tainted with crime must be beyond reasonable doubt. Yeah. So these are two different things. So I'm asking yeah. Uh, the reason why I asked for the standard of proof in this matter, which is civil in nature, of course, when you say that people have manipulated yes. the process, you're talking a criminal dimension into uh, what is generally a civil, uh, a civil situation. But the question is that those who believe that the lawyers in the Peter Obi matter did not do justice in trying as much as possible to tell the court that the election was rigged. No. And that those who say the, the lawyers should blame themselves yeah. and not blame the process no, no, of the no, law. No, 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 no. The process of law is very clear. The court told you that INEC has discretion. Where is it in the law? And I'm saying it is fundamentally wrong because that goes against the judgment of Supreme Court. Against what rule of law has defined itself as I told you that rule of law rules out discretionary powers. And INEC is a creation of the law. INEC itself made rules and regulations and say they must transmit electronically. After that 2023 election, I watched your program and you were asking some of the electoral officers because you wanted yourself to know what is the position of the law. Are you going to transmit electronically? And they say yes. They will transmit electronically that that is the position of the law in your program. Meanwhile, the court said no, that's not the position of the law because they have a discretion to do whatever they like. Can you imagine? And the Supreme Court supported it. I disagree with that, and I will continue to disagree with that perpetually because it's a destruction of rule of law. INEC is a creation of the law, and INEC must do all its work according to the law. A creation of law is telling you what the law is. And you, the court, is saying, no, that's not the law. Is that not ridiculous? Now, those who do believe that the elections are over, uh, the winner has been declared, the losers have been declared, is it possible that Kenneth Okonko move on from this? Why not? Have you moved on? I have not moved on because you have not moved on. Why did you ask me? Because of your belief and your standpoint, Good. which may need some clarity. And, and that's, that's what I'm why, asking you. That's why I clarify. So if you move on, I'll move on. Have you accepted the Bella Tinubu is Nigeria's president? I've been asked this thing before. The Supreme Court is the final court of the land. I said the judgment of the Supreme Court has bestowed constitutionality on his regime, but not democracy. Democracy is the government of the people. The power must verifiably flow from the people. I have not been convinced that his power you from the people because the people have not been told according to the electoral act section 62 they've not been given their results pulling unit by pulling unit and tabulated and calculated an answer given if you have seen such please let me know i have not and in mathematics if you go straight to code the answer without the formula they will tell you probably you stole it so if you have seen the formula with which they arrived at that conclusion, you as a journalist, pulling unit by pulling unit, I will be willing to cross-check it. The judiciary, when we went to Mr. court, Okonkwa. when we went to court, by the IRF portal, we were able to calculate 
to show that we won the election in Benue and we won the election in Rivers. But they said, no, it's not admissible because he came by a subpoena witness which brought his evidence after the 21 days. So, sorry. The, the judiciary is a leg in our democratic process. So, yes, if the judiciary the says elected. President Tunubu is the president... That is why he's answering president. Yeah, but do you see him as your president, though? I wouldn't know what you're saying. I said the Supreme Court is the final court. The first statement I made was that I disagree with the Supreme Court. But because I'm a Democrat, I accept the judgment. That is the judgment the Supreme Court said. And that is what I accepted. But will you be willing, for example, not yes. because you're a, Niger no, you're a Nigerian, yes. and you said you have accepted this, are you willing to, to move on and perhaps in some way help this government to succeed? Very well. If you are called today yes. by the government of the day to work with them, yes. would you take it? Criticizing the government constructively is part of helping them. But if and you are actively called yes. to play a role and an announcement is made yes. that Kenneth Okonko is taking this role in this government, would you take it? I am enjoying the role I'm playing now. So you will not take which it? Which is to critically analyze whatever they are doing and proffer solutions. So well, you will not take any role? My preference is what I am doing now. To be a critic? To be an opposition leader. So that's the job of the opposition leader. So, but for the sake of the nation, would you be willing to work with this government? I think the government needs more me. They need me. The government needs me more as an opposition leader. You, do you have a feeling that in some way that Nigeria is headed for in the right direction under this government in the last nine months? Anarchy looms. Where? In Nigeria. How do you mean? Anarchy is defined. As a state of disorder due to absence of or no recognition of authority or other controlling systems in this nation now you could see the absence of government in the security and welfare of the people total absence let's take the issue of security and you see why i always cry about rule of law Anarchy is the absence of rule of law and the presence of state of nature, which Thomas Hobbes described as being characterized in a nation where life has become short, brutish, nasty, poor, and solitary. We are approaching the state of nature. Take the issue of security. More than 200 persons were massacred on the eve of Christmas in Plateau State. Where was your government? They were in Lagos celebrating Christmas party. Absence of government. Shell. In March alone. And March has not reached. Today is 20th. So meaning within two weeks of March, more than 165 farmers have been killed and 3 billion naira demanded as ransom. Farmers, we have 109 senatorial zones in Nigeria, meaning for the first two weeks of March, average of more than one farmer has been killed in every senatorial zone. Absence of government. You have seen in this March how 287 innocent children and pupils we are taken in Kaduna and headed like cattle into the bush without anybody confronting them. No security presence. Absence of authority as anarchy. Would you blame all of these on this present government? You have seen how our men on uniform, 17 of them, massacred in South South. When this government came in, they gave their office, the villa, with coat of arms to a non-state actor to malign our officers, to call them thieves. Is it by accident that the massacring of those 17 soldiers were from the area where the same person that called them thieves?
thieves came from. I shouted and warned. Because I've been a lawyer to the army. And I'm bearing a wound in my heart that I defended some officers in the court martial. One cases for them. And some of them went into the field and they were massacred by bandits, terrorists. So I am personally pained. I shouted. I said, this government, you don't know the damage you're doing to the image of our armed forces. That you're allowing somebody to come to Asorok sitting on the coat of arms meaning he's bearing the effrontery of the government to call our military men thieves now you have seen that the people are now treating the military men as thieves massacring and killing them when they just went to make peace in march alone that can be described as much madness in the southeast, you saw how people went into the UNTH Medical College and abducted the deputy director and the security man. In the southwest, you saw how two traditional leaders were killed and they stretched their hand to Kwara and killed another traditional ruler. In Sokoto, you saw the way they were kidnapped. In Boronu, people would go to IDP camps. I've just mentioned the six geopolitical zones where it's safe. In FCT, Nabiha died. And this government, you see, these bandits do no longer recognize the authority of this government. That's why somebody has their phone three to come out publicly and say, let me negotiate, let the government buy me to negotiate with the terrorists. That was why the terrorists kidnapped 287 persons and demanded 40 trillion naira as ransom. Why? They are looking at themselves as the government. That is anarchy, no recognition of the authority of government. Are we talking only about security? You want to talk about the economy? And you will be amazed. And you want to talk about rule of law? The problem is that this government does not even articulate its policies before bringing it out. Look at the student loan scheme. A government on its own prepared the law, took it to the National Assembly. The National Assembly, it's not only appointees that take a bow and go, even legislation take bows and go. The National Assembly, the photocopy. National Assembly, allow the student loan scheme to take a bow and go. And the executive now discovered that they could not even implement it because the provisions are unimplementable. And nobody in the National Assembly even pointed it out. The executive had to go back to National Assembly to write another bill. Student loan scheme. Their own policy. The bill was from them. And they confessed it was unimplementable by their own letter within nine months. And the bow and go National Assembly, they still took the bill and told the amended bill to bow and go. First subsidy is gone. They are paying almost a trillion naira monthly on first subsidy. So what have they achieved apart from punishing the people? Employment, expatriate employment levy. They introduced it without even consulting man, Manufacturing Association of Nigeria. They have now removed it. They sanctioned Nigeria Republic. Ill advisedly punished the whole eight northern states, predominantly Muslims. The Muslim Muslim ticket. And after nine months, they removed it. Nigeria Republic said, No, we are not ready yet. You know why? Because you may have the right to declare when a war will commence, but you will not have the right to declare when it ends. This government is bereft of knowledge. That is why before you declare war, you would have to analyze how it will end and know whether you can go in. Nigeria is not Lagos where you sit down and you decree things and you expect it to work that way. Nigeria is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multinational society and you have to factor in every interest and you have to employ the utilitarian school of thought in your decisions and law 
And this school of thought says you must look at how you will achieve the greatest happiness of mm-hmm. or the greatest number of people whenever you want to make a policy. So if you are doing any policy that has six geopolitical zones, your aim is four geopolitical zones and above. This government in terms of appointment is just concentrating, not even on Southwest, on the Lagos axis of the Jagabanic proteges, tinted with the embilock of philosophy. Just that axis alone. And you're thinking you want to command loyalty, national loyalty? You won't even get it from Southwest. You want to command national loyalty? As a management student, they taught me about bureaucratic sabotage. This government is going to have an avalanche of it. Now, bureaucratic sabotage means, for instance, I am a director in a company and I'm coming to my office. There is a bottle broken bottle that I just saw. I know if I leave this bottle, it's going to pierce somebody and wound somebody. But I also know that I am not the cleaner. It's not my duty. So if I pretend I didn't see it, nobody is going to hold me responsible. But I just sabotage bureaucracy because that bottle will wound somebody and the image of the organization will not be done. So, People will not sabotage you when they have a sense of belonging and when they have a sense of loyalty to you. So it is not every sabotage that is illegal. There are some sabotage that is inspirational. People will like, why would I die for this government? Why would I do this? It's not my job. But they needed to do it to help the government. That's why we need inspiring leaders. Leaders that can make people to do something that is right, even when they're not there. Is that why you supported Peter Obi? Absolutely. You think Peter Obi is better than what we're having today? An inspiring leader. That those who believe that Peter Obi does not even measure up. He was there in Anambra State. Those who say you cannot compare Anambra and Lagos State, if that is the Indies. Good. You can compare the policies. You can compare the environment. When P2B came into Anambra State, Anambra was coming last in education. The governor, governor of Anambra State, the former governor, Shumo Kembadunuchu, was the only governor that PDP did not allow to return for the second time. Only. So you can imagine the level of, of, of death that Anambra State was suffering. People were massacred on the street, including the chairman of MBA. Security was terrible. Infrastructure was comatose. Education was appalling. Peter B. came in. Turned the whole situation. Within two years, three years. The number was coming first. The medical facilities, golden. Infrastructure, superb. He changed it from consumption to production. That even some of his opponents that don't know what they say, <laughs> they are accusing him that he invested Anambra State money in some companies that are yielding something for Anambra State today. He met nothing in Anambra State. He saved so much that the subsequent governor used part of it to build an international airport by his own confession. You don't compare gold with carrots. Is that what you would say between Peter B and Bola Tinobu? That those who say Anambra does not measure up. You can't measure Anambra and Lagos State by every standard. You know, when you want to judge a man, you judge him by his antecedents. You know what happened in Lagos? The look of philosophy is familitocracy. Have you ever seen Pitobi receive any land in Anambra State? He rejected every land, including the one he's entitled to. Go to Lagos State. You know better than myself. Some people describe the owners of Lagos as the largest land owners. The owner of West Africa. Go to Lagos. The same dynasty has been ruling from 1999. Wife, senator, daughter, son. Even in, as the leader of Nigeria, 
<laughs> the same pattern. I mean, you you're making allegations of nepotism. That's it's what not you. Not allegations. The facts are there. That this government is nepotistic. Something worse than nepotistic. Is that fair to say? I mean, to crash. You know what it means when you place your children in order of protocol before ministers of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. What do you call that? What do you call that? I saw. What is that? You know what it means when you put your wife at par with the vice president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in terms of number one, in terms of security. Have you seen a Michelle Obama being involved in the political process of America? Let me tell you, I thought Buhari's regime was going to be the worst. In nine months, this government has surpassed it. Let me tell you, this government started from the man himself to the wife, to the sons, using the private jet to attend parties, desecrating the hollow chamber of leadership. Talk about the daughters, talk about the sons in laws, the daughters in laws. Then, before you go to the daughters and sons of friends, what do you call that? What leadership system is that? It's a country that has its geopolitical zones. And you're just appointing only the people from that your little clique. And you're expecting loyalty. This government, Mr. Kunku, said, look, we're making some policies that might be painful in the moment, but it's going to be like the pangs of childbearing. In the end, it's going to be some joy. Are you hopeful? of the possibility that this process is just momentary at the end of the day there's light at the end of the tunnel in all of these policies that this government is putting in place if your wife is pregnant and after the pangs of childbirth she gave birth to a monster would you rejoice all their policies have been given birth to monsters, not children. You thought those first subsidy is gone. And after punishing the people, the first subsidy is remaining. What have you given birth to? Monster. You told us you're unifying the dual foreign exchange. And after a while, Naira has become worthless. Even less valid than the safer. And you again, you're telling us, no, that's not the true reflection of the value of Naira. And you are the one who voluntarily devalued the Naira, uh, Naira to that level. Is that childbirth? No. That is a monster. You told us that you're imposing sanctions on the Nigerian public so that they would go back to democracy. Have they gone to democracy? You lifted the sanction. What have you achieved? You punished the eight states of the north from KB to Sokoto, to Zamfara, to Jigawa, to Katsina, to Yobe, to Boronu. You brought all of them, punished them immensely. And after eight months without achieving anything, is that childbirth? No, childbirth is that you give birth to something new. When thesis and antithesis meet, they give birth to synthesis. That is something new. Childbirth. Not when you finish punishing the people and you go back to a situation that is worse than they were when you started the policy. That is monster. So this government, sorry, the pangs of childbirth have been a punishment. You're telling people to be patient. And you're wearing a watch. What of millions? Why you're telling people to be patient? Is that childbirth? You're telling people to be patient. You say you want to, uh, you know, implement or sign a report. And you have for the eight ministers. Even Motola Mohammed, when he became head of state, I learned the first thing he did was to purge himself. To say, look, this, this, this is not right. I'll start with myself. If you want to implement such things like Orosanya, start with yourself. Orosanya is about cutting the cost of governance. So where is the child birth in this? No, it's not child birth. It is monster. I can tell you, with all the pains in a woman, if she gives birth and she discovers she has given birth to a monster, she herself will run away. 
Nigerians are running away from these so-called policies because they are simply punishing the people for nothing. 2,000 naira for a dollar. And you see, it's a childbirth. No, it's a monster. So you don't believe there is hope? I've always said there is renewed hopelessness. That's what I am seeing. Why are you so pessimistic? I am not pessimistic. That's the best optimism you can give. So that they can even see whether they can change. When they removed first subsidy, I say reverse it that day. And they say, I was pessimistic. What's happening today? <laughs> Why people did not die of hunger then was they had savings. And then they deceived them that over a little while, these things will be okay. They are no longer deceiving them. They finished their savings. It's not okay. And you see, they've already started preparing their mind that look, oh, even if the refining is start working, that does not mean the price will fall. Then what is the child belt that you have given birth to? That's a monster. You just gave birth to a monster. You perhaps have in your mind that if yes. Peter Obi was a president, things would have been different. Things would have been sweet. If Peter Obi was the president. Yes, because when Peter Obi tells you sacrifice, he will see the sacrifice by himself first. But you supported a Buhari you got into office. Yes. Now, those who believe that Buhari government led us into this mess. Good. Buhari's government was good from 2015 to 2019. And now, you know, you grow every day. That has taught me about the need for the independence of the legislature. What is government were they were not allowed to borrow against the law because there was a Saraki and Dogara who were independent of the executive. In 2015 to 2019, that was when you heard Boko Haram was technically defeated. Everything was moving towards the right direction. I entered ABC 2016. So the last duty I did with APC publicly was 2018 after 2019 and we had the rubber stamp national assembly that was when everything went sour the 22 trillion naira you are hearing ways and means most of them were done within 29 uh, uh, from 2019 to 2023 everything evil that was when everything went haywire security and all this because there was a robber stamp national assembly who will agree to whatever they bring but it was not like that in the first time so when this government came in and it's not just being robber stamp but photocopy i knew the government was gone so you blame the Ahmed lawan and send the jadian leadership of the national assembly for the failure of the buari government in the second term do you know the only reason that you have legislature is to check and balance the excesses of the executive. The only reason. And look at how much we are wasting on the legislature. And yet, they cannot do the job. They contributed substantially to what happened to that regime. Did you regret supporting Buhari? No, I don't. Would you still support him if you had your dictionary? There is no word like regret. I wrote, I wrote a dictionary and sent it to Oxford. They looked at it and they returned it and said they will not approve it. And I resisted and petitioned them. And they said it's because they checked my dictionary and the word regret was not there. So I don't have any word regret in my dictionary. You learn from your mistakes. So it was a mistake supporting Buhari? No. As at the time I supported him, he was doing things right. If you had the opportunity of going back to the APC, would you take it? I've always said, I don't belong to the category of using the word never. Because as a theologian, you are rogating God to yourself. It's only God that knows tomorrow. I don't have that intention. I don't have that inclination. But I am the last to say never. Because never belongs to God. If you allow me to say, I'll say I will not. But I will not say never. Because never belongs to God. You've been wanting to become 
Enugu State Governor. Yes, we yes. still have that ambition. Whoever is in politics can no longer pretend he's not interested in power. What do you want to use the power for? That is what will guide you and drive you. However, presently, I do not have any intention for any political office. I am more focused on my job as a lawyer, my litigation, my businesses, and then trying to ensure that we have a new Nigeria. Because you have to secure the ground first before looking for the mat. So you might still go back to wanting to become governor of Enugu State, but not for now. As far as I am concerned with me, anything can happen tomorrow. It's in the hand of God. But today, I am not interested in becoming governor of Enugu State. Today, I am not. Let me take you to the politics of your party. Your party is in disarray. The Labour Party. You see what is happening? Yes. We are one of those calling for the head of Julius Abure. Why? <laughs> I don't know whether you're right. <laughs> but I know that I said I disagree with the clandestine nature of the way they want to handle the issue of national convention. I find it unconstitutional and I find it unconventional. And the way they are going about it, I find it very abusive and uncharacteristic of Labour Party. Let me tell you one provision of the Constitution of Labour Party I admire so much. And the aims and objectives of the party. Article 8C of the Constitution. He said, the aim of this party should be to create a new Nigerian personality who is patriotic, altruistic, transparent, committed to due process and rule of law in governance, in industry, and in other aspects of our national life. So anything you're doing in Labour Party and is not transparent and you're not being selfless and you're not being patriotic and you're not committed to the rule of law and due process. Sorry. That falls short of the constitutional requirement of Labour Party. Do you know I saw the notice of the convention in the social media like any other person? And I was the one who was calling the executives to confirm before I even tell people that it is true that they, they fixed the national convention. I saw it in the social media. It's Political party and occultic clandestine society. Are you a card car member of the Labour Party? Yes, I am. You joined from your state in Enugu State. Very well. <laughs> After they came to Abuja to register me, even my ward chairman from Musuka sent a representative. I went to the national headquarters and then went back to my ward and completed the registration. So I am a member of Labour Party. What I mean. If the also think that the Labour Party chairman assumed office illegally, you agree with that argument? Assumed office illegally, I will disagree. Because I know that when the other chairman died, the National Executive Council met and chose him to become the chairman, which is constitutional. By virtue of Article 13, to be XVI. The National Executive Council can fill any gap in between national convention. They can also discipline anybody. You know what? The seat of the administration of Labour Party is not in the National Working Committee. It's in the National Executive Council. The National Working Committee, for instance, has no power whatsoever in anything that has to do with national convention. If you check the constitution, article 13, 3b, you will not find the phrase national convention mentioned in one of the functions of the National Working Committee. The power is bestowed 100% on the National Executive Council. So what they are doing right now is illegal and unconstitutional. 
And when they talk about NLC, I feel very, very sad. Is it that they are doing it mischievously? Or they are doing it ignorantly? They're trying to say NLC. First of all, what they said about Jajero. That Jajero is doing what he's doing. Because he's interested in the executive positions in National Working Committee. And that you are one of those Jajero is planning to use to force as leadership on the party. <laughs> You know why I'm laughing? I do not have any communication with any member of the National the Nigerian Labour Congress. None. I've never sat down one on one to discuss with Joe Ajer about the Labour Party. A few occasions I met him, we exchanged pleasantries. Very few occasions, and everybody left. But let me tell you the people that are doing the wrong thing. I hate when people appropriate and reprobate. When the renegade faction went to the secretariat and threw out Abure and his officers, it was still the same Joe Ajero that mobilized the Nigerian Labour Congress under the correct position. The Nigerian Labour Congress is a factor in Labour Party. And that you people that came in, came in from the back door. It was still this judge that mobilized people and went to the national and threw those people out and restored Julius Aburi and his members. And now they are turning back when the same Joe Ajero and NLC use the same method because they are saying what you're doing is illegal and unconstitutional to preserve and protect the integrity and sanctity of the secretariat like they did before. Now you're in the receiving end. And I'm saying all the things you don't know. Let me tell you. NLC is part and parcel of the National Executive Council and even the National Working Committee, statutorily. Sure, not as an organization, but the Constitution gave them power to elect one of the National Deputy Chairman. Must be from NLC. One from TUC. As members, do you know that the presidents and secretaries of labor centers are members of the National Executive Council? Statutorily. I am talking about Article 13 of the Labor Party Constitution. It is here. A National Working Committee. That's why we have three deputy national chairmen in Labor Party. One of them must be from NLC. The other from TUC. One must be a woman. Women leaders of labor centers are members of the National Executive Council. They are accusing Joe Ajero of, yes. of uh, bearing a presidential ambition. And that's why he's doing all of this to the Labour Party. First of all, I find it laughable. And you know why? Is it because of what is happening that they are bringing the blackmail? You know when you say they want to pencil me down? <laughs> I think I was watching your show, was it yesterday? <laughs> and when I heard my name, I, I was looking around to know that there is another Kenneth Ogongo. <laughs> I think the guy just likes dropping my name. Maybe my name gives him vitamin Kwekwe, and he just can't uh, stop it if he believes that he derives some essential nutrients from mentioning it. So he just can't stop it. And me being a lawyer that allows people to have their freedom, you know. But you know what? I do not succumb to the blackmail of professional troublemakers. What do you expect from them? They feed from the crisis. So they will always blackmail. When Judge Jero was defending them, you saw Abude standing by the side of Judge Jero. Judge Jero was the king, this, this, and that. Now I saw what that person, he just mentioned his name. I saw what he said. He's now talking about making as if he's now rapporting the Abude faction. You know why? Because the court of appeal just nullified them. And please, when you call them again and use the word faction, you are you are rendering yourself liable to be sued. Because the court of appeal has thrown away their case. That's why you did not hear him mention again in Tarim order. You didn't hear him saying Abure forged or did not forge. Now he's saying they are one party. You heard him. <laughs> and then uh, he's now George Jero that is the criminal. <laughs> 
It's not NLC. These people do not have principles. They feed on crisis. So you think that Julius Abu's time as national chairman of the party is over and he should go? No. Is that what you think? No. Constitutionally, if he believes that he has the right to contest under a free and fair convention, you know, I heard them saying that they want to go to a national convention first rather than starting from the world. Maybe they forgot that in the constitution of the Labour Party, that delegates from the state congress are part of the national convention. Maybe they forgot. And again, most of these people from the world level are appointed. How can appointed people come to elect people in the national convention? You can't give what you don't have. There has to be, because the Labour Party is now growing. So you have to build the structures from the world level. You do your world level congress, you do your state congress, then if he organizes free and fair convention, if he presents himself, which he has the constitutional right to do, if he wins, because what I am interested in is due process and rule of law. But you think, in yes. your mind, in that opinion, Julius Abu Abure should were, go? If I were Julius Abure, I would not contest to be the chairman of Labour Party. Why? I mean, the renegade group has alleged that you forged things. The former acting national chairman, a woman, has alleged that you forged things. Some candidates that offered themselves for election on the Labour Party have alleged you forged something. Your national treasurer has alleged you forged something. The NLC, who is a prominent member has alleged you forged something. Let me tell you in politics, you win by perception. It is when you go to court or you begin to talk about facts and evidence and law that in politics, the perception is not just right for you. If I were in his position, I would not contest. I am really surprised that he was even contemplating after all these things to contest. What perception are we going to have the Labour Party when we say we want people who not only that they are not corrupt, but they are incorruptible? Obi has been a governor for eight years, has been the chairman of banks, held certain positions of trust. How many people have accused him of forging anything? Why has Peter Obi not spoken up about this matter? When you see Peter Obi, you ask him. You are his friend. Yes, and he's a spokesperson. You don't think that if he speaks on this matter, yeah. this might actually heal what has become sort of a disgrace and a bad reputation for the Labour Party? Everybody has his own method and methodology of dealing with things. I am an entertainer, I'm an actor. He's a businessman. We may share the same principles and objectives, but we may not share the same temperament. Allow him to use his own method, just as you should allow me to use mine. So when you see him, you ask him. I will, definitely. Uh, to wrap this up, I'd like to take you to the politics of the southeast region of the country. This agitation that we see quite often, the, the, the IPOP, the Biafran agitation, how best do you think this can be resolved? Give those people sense of belonging. They need it. How do you do that? When the war finished, you promised them reconciliation, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. 50-something years after, you are contemplating in the National Assembly when, whether you will do it. And these are properties. They are hard-end properties destroyed by Nigerians. Who told them to go? That they don't want them to belong in the same country. Not that they wanted to go. They decimated our people and destroyed our properties. They promised reconciliation, rehabilitation, and reconstruction, and they failed. In the Northeast, it was the people from Northeast that became brainwashed and they destroyed all their things by themselves. And you? immediately set up a Northeast Development Commission. Even before the crisis ends. Even some of the ones that are built to 
rehabilitate. I think still being destroyed. And going to 60 something years or there about or 50 something, you have not reconciled these people. Bring them in, give them sense of belonging, integrate them politically. Is it by accident that from 1966, when Thomas Umunakwe Agui Major General, was decimated till today, Nigeria has been going down politically, socially, culturally, economically. Don't you think that if you integrate these people with their craft, with their engineering method, with their with their natural resilience, don't you think they are going to recreate this country for the betterment of everybody? When you do such a thing that you promise you will do, when you rehabilitate them, when you reconcile them, by integrating them adequately into the political system and giving them what they ought to have. They are a majority tribe in this country. When you do that, reconciliation, rehabilitation, reconstruction, you will see those agitation die naturally. I am a nationalist, but I am a realist. So as I am believing in Nigeria, it has to be a Nigeria built on equity justice and fairness. How would you think that the government of the day should handle the Enam de Kano matter? As a lawyer, I would not want to comment on a case that is before the court. But I think political settlement will go a long way to bring about lasting peace on that issue. If the Enam de Kano today is released and there is a political settlement, you think it will kill the agitation in the Southeast? That's a hypothetical question. I may not be able to answer that. But you have opined this afternoon yes. that this idea of the Biafran agitation can be quelled yes. if people are reconciled. And I'm yes. asking that the man who is at the forefront of that, this agitation, yes. you saying that a political settlement will help. Yes. And I'm asking you, is that a way to go? That's what I'm saying. If, for example, if the Kanu is released, if you bring out one million persons and you still do not reconcile, rehabilitate, and reconstruct these people, you're still going to have a problem. Is uh, creating a sixth state in the South is going to be part of it? Will help. Politically, what other means? Like I said, why wouldn't you constructively accede the position of the presidency to these people? To the well, southeast. Yes, it was done in 1999. If Peter B. had become the president of Nigeria, you think the Biafran agitation would die naturally? It would go a long way. Really? Very well. We talked about June 12. It was becoming intractable. When Obasanjo became president, the ghost of June 12 was exorcised. If Peter B. were to. So, guys, no. <clears throat> So guys, no doubt you enjoyed this session with Kenneth Okonkwo. You know, this man is an entertainer. So guys, no doubt you enjoyed this session with Kenneth Okonkwo. This man is an entertainer. And at the same time, he is loaded with knowledge. And you can see that he's following Peter Obi's pattern. All his yearning is for us to have a better Nigeria. For us to have a new Nigeria we all can, you know, be happy with. That is just what Kenneth Okonkwo said. And no doubt you understood his position. This is somebody who is not interested in, you know, uh, grabbing being power for grabbing sake he's not interested in you know running political errands for people he just wants to see nigeria work just like the position of mr peter will be and that is why we keep calling nigerians not to give up you know in this fight for a new nigeria you can see that together we are going to achieve it for the fact that we have people like this who are very very you know sincere with what their goal or their their desire is for nigeria i believe that we are going
are going to achieve it so guys you have seen it this government does not have a direction and like you know that the governor of Nasarawa state was telling Peter Obi to come share his idea with the government of the day meaning that they know Peter Obi has so much to offer but you know they didn't want to allow him to become president they went through the back door and now they don't have anything to offer the Nigerian people Peter Obi remains that man who can really help salvage the current situation in Nigeria. If not for any other thing, Peter Obi is ready to cut the cost of governors. Peter Obi is ready to reduce all the excesses, the waste stages we have in government. Peter Obi is ready to like manage the, the resources of the country, you know, properly, at least in those areas. Peter Obi is going to perform well. And tell me, if the economy begins to work well, what else are we looking for? Even all these bandits we have all over the places, they will be employed. They will have means of livelihood. Some of them don't know what next to do and that is why they are taking it into criminality let me know what you think about all this in the comment section below please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell thank you